Hi, everyone. This is Tom McShehe. We have a few gathered tonight. Um, Dr. Thomas, are you are you there on the call right now? Maybe not. She might be joining us. Well, hi, Lawrence County parents. Uh, this is Tom McShehe, as I said, and um, I'm going to get started. Tonight's topic that we're going to be talking about is trauma. And um, I'm, it's a topic that's really important to me personally. And maybe I should share just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been doing several presentations for Lawrence County, so maybe you've been on another meeting. But um, I taught 21 years as a elementary school teacher, and I've been a social worker for 25 years, a, a licensed social worker. So I work with families and parents and uh, adolescents and children. And um, so that's my background in mental health and education are what I've been involved in for 35 years. This topic is, as I said, really important to me personally, but I think as a society, it's such an important topic. And so I'm glad you're joining us tonight. And uh, for those who are gonna be watching this on recording, um, I'm glad that this information will get out there. I'm gonna show my PowerPoint to you so you can see my screen. So, um, there you go. And um, so understanding trauma and its effects on children's social emotional lives and um, Couple books that I want to recommend. One is um, Trauma Proofing Your Kids, A Parent's Guide for Instilling Confidence, Joy and Resilience by Peter Levine. Peter Levine's a psychiatrist and he's one of the pioneers in trauma treatment. Uh, and I just highly recommend this book. Um, you know, it's $16, but it, Peter gives you so much advice in that around preparing for going to the dentist or the doctor or if, if your child's having an operation, anything to do with um, any kind of trauma. And it's just, it's such a great resource. Again, in an, I'll, I'll share as much as I can in an hour, but, um, and hopefully maybe next year I can continue on this topic because an hour won't do justice. I'll def definitely give you some ideas that make you feel empowered because that's how I want you to leave this call, feeling like you you walked away with some some ideas that strengthened you. Um, but yes, this this book. And then, if your child or you as a parent have gone through developmental trauma, that means trauma as you were growing up in the early years as your brain was developing. This book it's called by Heather Forbes, Beyond Consequences, Logic, and Control. It's very much oriented towards attachment, which I'll be talking about next week, what happens between a child and a parent and how that affects the brain. But it also talks about trauma and ties it into the brain. So it's really a handy resource. Um, but if you're gonna go for one first, I'd go with Peter's, doc, Dr. Um, Levine. Just so you know a little bit about myself, uh, I, at the age of 38, discovered that I had had a severe um, or difficult birth, one that was sort of life and death. And, and that trauma and birth, I never was told. And it explains a lot of my anxiety, I think, as a young boy. Um, and my sort of constant fear of whether I'll survive or not. Um, and so it's that that's why it's so important, you know, trauma is, not too many people know about it. And there are many people who have gone through various types of trauma. That is, it's very healable. Um, but if you don't know you have it, it's hard to heal it. So for me, it really affected my childhood. And this topic really, it, it motivates me to speak to people on it. As I said, it was a tough birth that, that many babies don't survive and I did. And um, then as a kid, you know, there was obviously family dynamics that are, that made that I came into the world with that sort of challenge. And then the dynamics in my family just kind of made anxiety worse um, because I didn't have an emotional connection with my folks as, as caring as they were, they just didn't know how to coach me emotionally. 
And that made for, I think as a little boy, I suffered way too much with anxiety. And then as in high college with depression. And um, again, that's sort of what motivates me to speak to parents and teachers. You maybe have heard the term PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. We've learned so much in the last 20 years about this, probably a lot to, because of brain science. And, um, you know, any type of war veterans coming back from the military, I mean, coming back from war in the military, um, this is a big issue. And, you know, a large percentage of veterans often take their life um, because of PTSD and ha having been through it, and I still feel like I have remnants of it. The best way I just can describe it, if you don't know what post-traumatic stress disorder is, is it's your brain, you could be in a very okay situation where it's a safe situation. And you can intellectually know that, but your body is constantly in a state of survival, you know, this feeling of life and death. And that's 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 post-traumatic. And it's it's really tough for anyone who's living with it, has gone through it. I think you would, you understand if you haven't, it's, it, it is, I mean, it's, you can understand why people take their life because it's, it's just, it's a hard place to live. Some parents might have experienced some form of trauma or PTSD or other difficult emotional psychological experiences during their lives. And you might, you probably get triggered all the time every day as a parent or as a human being for that matter you know, something really causes you to feel big emotions. So, so be gentle with yourself as you would with a child. And that's hard. I think to really be gentle on the areas that we feel um, overwhelmed in is tough. I wanna just tell you, it's very normal to numb out, to space out, to get agitated or speed up when we're overwhelmed or difficult memories or sensations are being triggered. And that's hopefully what learning about this and getting support will do that you'll you won't have to numb out or space out you know to survive or to cope or to calm yourself here's the factors associated with resilience because no matter how much trauma you've been through often people it's not trauma for every child because they have people around them supporting them so that overwhelming experience isn't doesn't feel traumatizing Without support, it can be, and we'll explain why that is in a little while. The presence of a caring adult who takes an interest in the life of a child, that could be a teacher, a coach, or a parent. A supportive, caring community, again, that could be in a form of a school or a classroom or a church or a team or a family. A sense of self-efficacy, that means I can have an impact on the world, I can make things happen. Often people have been through trauma, feel like they don't have control because when they went through that traumatic experience, they, they lost control and the body keeps wanting to gain control and, and have a sense of control and they often feel helpless. And this is a study of impoverished children um, from 1983. Another study, early childhood factors that build mental health and resilience, caring child adult relationships, Emotional regulation or self-control, and that's what we're gonna be working on and discussing a lot tonight. Self-esteem or self-concept, how do you view yourself or how do you use your child? Because often when you go through trauma, you can feel like something's wrong with you. And um, self-efficacy, again, that word of, do, do I have power? Can I impact my life? And this is from child and adolescent psychiatrists and mental health. One thing I want you to know is the foundation of mental health or social emotional learning is quality connection. Almost all mental health issues start with some sense of disconnection and the lack of support and being overwhelmed. Attachment is my area of specialty um, and what happens to the brain in terms of a parent and their connection to a child or baby and even to a teacher and a student. It's so important. I think this is at the foundation of, of our lives really is how we connect with people. So this relationship, this is, we all went through this and maybe your parents were there in a way you needed, maybe they weren't because they were overwhelmed that they had traumatic issues going on or they're dealing with low income issues. 
it's hard to always be there, but you know, babies need parents who are responsive and, and present emotionally to really develop their brains and nervous systems. These are the four skills, believe it or not, that babies are developing in the first year and a half of life. They're learning in, in, while they're in connection to the parent how to regulate emotion, control impulses, pay attention and self-soothe. These are learned skills. How are they learned? Obviously through connection, this synergy back and forth between a baby and a parent. Communi communication, connection, containment, this feeling of being held and contained and pressure. We're gonna come back to that word. It's pretty, it's unbelievable, but somewhere between 90, 80 to 90%, I think it's more 90, some say 80% of communication is nonverbal between a baby and an adult or parent. And that's true for human beings too. So much of our communication is nonverbal. And I'll talk more about why that is. So when you look at this window of tolerance, and it explains everything on this planet, really, every behavior during the day. Ideally, if we get the right care we need as a baby, you know, a responsive parent who help us helps us to self-soothe and self-regulate, you'll stay in this window of tolerance and you'll develop the ability to have a window of tolerance. What does that mean? That means if I'm feeling really scared or anxious or angry or, or hurt um, or even a lot of joy or love that I'll be able to stay in relationship with another human being. Often, if it's too much for us that we didn't, we didn't get support as a child from our parents and learning how to feel emotions and, and calm ourselves, that gets wired into the brain. It's a skill. If we don't get that support, then we're gonna get, we're probably gonna get very hyper aroused and look at those, that's high energy, anxiety, anger, overwhelm, hypervigilance, fight or flight or fight and chaotic. We all go, I mean, this is sort of normal. And some of that energy of high energy is okay. You just don't wanna be too much. And if we're in the, Ideally, you kind of want to be in that middle zone, truthfully, the window of tolerance. If you go to either extreme, you're going to, you're going to be in a state that doesn't feel good. Now, if you drop down to the, the bottom, hypoarousal, that's where you sort of shut down. You numb out. Depression, passive, you're withdrawn. You freeze or there's shame involved. So... This is what we're learning early on and what we continue to learn as an adult. And if there's one thing you can teach your child and what you teach them through connection is developing this window of tolerance. I wanna to discuss the brain because it relates so much to trauma. As you know, if, is that we know so much about the brain. We really do, it's an amazing time to be alive. And one thing about the young brain from birth, even in utero to three years old, that so much is happening in the brain that sets sort of a foundation for the rest of your life. It can be changed, but you want to wire it in a healthy way and not have to go back and repair. Um, it's like almost wet clay. That's the best analogy, you know, how soft wet clay is. And then you think of as clay gets dries out a little, it gets harder and you have to work it more. Well, that's sort of how a young brain is. It's very affected by stimulation that's healthy or lack of stimulation. And it's, it's definitely a critical time. The first year and a half is critical for social emotional learning, being able to process our emotions. This is a real brain, the right side of the brain. And this is how the brain develops the sequence, the brainstem, then it moves on to the limbic system. And we're working on developing the front, frontal cortex behind our eyes all the way up to 25 or 29 years old. It varies on gender. So this is an ongoing process. Now, at birth, the two bottom ones are online. If you notice what the brainstem does, it's safety and survival. So when I was born into this world and I was fighting you know, sort of life and death, my brainstem, my whole body system was struggling, right? So I was in 
survival mode. And I wasn't feeling very safe coming in this world nor after my birth. And then the limbic system, which half of it's online, is all about emotions and motivation and connection. These two are online at birth. So it's very important, <clears throat> ideally, not all births are ideal, but all births can be repaired. And um, I spent two years, I did uh, 350 hours with someone who was an expert in birth and the first three years and how you repair if healthy attachment doesn't happen. So it's something I know a lot about personally, but professionally, and it's so important this age. I wish our society embraced this age more and our government funded this age, especially for parents who are low income. It's tough to be a parent and be fully present when you're struggling for food and housing. And so this is the percentage of the, the brain that's online at birth. And again, this is important. We'll come back to this in terms of trauma. But if you look at 100% of the brain stems working and 50% of the emotional center is working. Now you look at the frontal cortex and that 0% is online. What that means is babies don't have the ability to self-soothe. Like right now, if I get anxious and my stomach starts getting tight, I can think in my frontal cortex, Tom, you need to take a deep breath and you know, put a little pressure. Well, a baby does not have the ability to self-reflect on their sensations and emotions. They're, they depend on their caregiver to help them self-regulate, to deal with big emotions and big sensations. If there's not a caregiver there, they just feel that overwhelm with no sense of sort of soothing. And that's why in the old days, in my days, I guess, when I was a young child, there's a belief that you let a baby cry it out until we found out about neuroscience and how little, none of the front brain is online. So there's a new philosophy, which is not a philosophy, it's a science, is that you really need in the first nine months to be the frontal cortex of your child until it comes online. And eventually they're going to learn how to self-soothe themselves by you self-soothing. So it kicks into gear at eight months, that frontal cortex comes online. So any trauma to the mom or the dad or the family during this time can be tough on a baby. In utero, if a mom is on any type of drugs or is under a lot of stress or after the birth, it can be tough for the baby in terms of their uh, brain development. Often babies who are born into depressed moms are depressed themselves later in life. So interventions early is important or in school, because if you get them in preschool at four, five, six, and seven, you can do a lot in the classroom. So what are the languages? And I'm going to come back to this. It should be the three languages of the brain, because this is a skill I can teach you. I will teach you at home. The brain sense talks to you through physical sensations like a racing heart or butterflies in your stomach, things like that. The limbic system talks to you through emotions like happiness, sadness, anger, hurt, fear, and love, and through memories. When you have an emotional memory, it's coming from the limbic system. The frontal cortex or cortex is words and images. So we'll come back to this. I want to talk about this is a real life structures and this is really important that pink dot it's the size of an almond on both sides it's your smoke alarm it's the area that when you feel threatened or something's dangerous it sets off an alarm in your body it drops a bunch of cortisol and adrenaline in and gets you ready to fight or flee or freeze and this is an important structure, but in kids who go through trauma early in life, it gets too sensitized. And it's my analogy is it's like a, a smoke alarm in your house that goes off when you put the tea kettle on. Any little amount of heat or threat sets off the smoke alarm of a traumatized child or a traumatized adult. And the, the hippocampus, the blue structure, is your emotional memory. If you have too much cortisol in your bloodstream, it shrinks the hippocampus, which is your emotional memory. And that's problematic. And so we definitely want to intervene some point in a child's life, even if they have a rough start. The good part is the brain is changeable and intervention, good, healthy intervention can repair it. 
if a lot of damage happens in certain parts, can you, I mean, I'm an optimist when it comes to the brain, it's remarkable, but uh, I mean, this is what's concerning with some kids when they really go through a lot of trauma. You know, some end up in prison, not because they're a bad person, there are no bad babies. They come into this world like all other humans, you know, with potential, but challenges can come into life that make it hard on them. Cortisol damage to those three areas of the brain. So the, the limbic system, the, the hippocampus, th th that the white structure there connects the right hemisphere and left. And we're gonna come back to that, the right and left hemisphere. It's called the corpus callosum that gets damaged by too much cortisol. And whoops, and the last one is the frontal cortex can also get some damage to it. That's the real life structure. I show this every presentation because I want everyone out there or who's watching and recording to know that the emotional structures of the brain is, is the same for all human beings, regardless of race or anything. So it's the insides we all feel the same about the world. I just want to quickly orient towards the nervous system because in trauma, this gets overwhelmed. It's sort of our circuit break. It's like wires in a house. This is our wiring. And when anything is too much, we have two branches to that. The sympathetic part of the nervous system, which gets us fired up to do work, it's good. Action and work, it fires the body up. The parasympathetic is rest and recovery. It slows your body down, relaxation. We don't do enough. When you're in a trauma, you spend a lot of time in a sympathetic nervous system you, because you're fired up and want to survive, too much so, and you want to balance it off like this. Ideally, you want your nervous system to get go from sympathetic to parasympathetic and up and down where you get stimulated and calm, stimulated and calm. And I can't say our society is that way. It's usually way out of the parameters of a healthy nervous system. I use this analogy, the brainstem will drop sensations in, the limbic system emotions and this container is sort of a child's body. When it, when it, if we're not doing things to help them calm or to move the energy, it's gonna overflow and they're gonna get act out and have a meltdown or something like that or, or go away. And that's why it's so important that we don't let kids overflow and get too overstimulated or not be able to cope with the stimulation. What is trauma? It's about as big a definition. I won't be this heady the rest of the time. Individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that's experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, and social and or spiritual well-being. Again, not everyone's affected by the same stimulus. Some, some things are traumatizing to one that's not the others. What are the causes of trauma? Physical or sexual abuse or an incident of severe neglect. Severe acts of emotional or psychological abuse. And there's something called developmental trauma. This is when it's happening when we're young, physical, emotional, sexual abuse has a more profound effect on the brain than if we're older. Witnessing harm to others. So if you live in a home where the people, there's abuse, that's hard on you. National disasters, earthquakes and hurricanes are a part of life. Human caused events like war and terrorism, terrorism, unfortunately, a lot of the world, I mean, the Middle East is living with that right now. Acts of community or domestic violence. Here in Chicago, it's a daily thing on the news, you know. Accidents and medical emergencies. I know I've had my share and I think most humans will go through some type of things. The sudden death of a loved one. I went through that as a young boy and the serious and prolonged illness of someone in your family or yourself as a child. Individuals respond differently depending on your age, of course. Your personality, if you're highly sensitive, last week we talked about highly sensitive kids and um, you know they feel more deeply. And so these kind of things affect them more. Previous history of trauma. So if you have go through something tough and you've already been through a lot of tough things, that makes it extra hard. Accidents and medical emergencies, if you've been through a series of them, the sudden death of a loved one again, 
again, if you've been through a serious and prolonged illness before, another one is going to maybe be harder unless you've dealt with it, you know, and gotten support. Because you can get stronger. The thing, the trauma can be a transformative thing with support that it can actually help you almost come out of it stronger if, if you know, if you get the right support. Physical or sexual abuse or an incident of severe neglect. You know, neglect can also be tough on kids. It's as, as tough as abuses. Severe acts of, whoops, I repeated a few, but this is sort of repetitive, sorry, but I wanted to go over. What are the traumatic conditions that occur over time that are really hard, that are traumatic for some, a child? Poverty or low income, living amongst high levels of crime and violence, which also usually comes with low income if you're trying to survive, you know? Exposure to drug and alcohol abuse, exposure to others with mental illness, the sudden death of a loved one, having a developmental disability or living with others with such disabilities. So there's something, Dr. Thomas is gonna give you some links near the end, but one of them is a link to National Public Radio and they have a little article on adverse childhood experiences are called ACEs. Um, and it's a little quiz you can take to find out you know, to add up your score for yourself. It's just, it's a barometer. It's not set in stone because again, you might've had supports that those experiences didn't really overwhelm you. But there's a high correlation between ACEs and health issues later in life. A big study by um, oh, Kaiser Permanente um, that saw such a high correlation between health issues and early trauma. And I can tell you that um, a lot of my physical ailments, I have back injuries and a lot, a tight body that's made it very difficult when I was playing sports younger and later in life, that a lot of it's because my body is so in the hypervigilance for years, living with sort of tightness. That all came from early trauma. And boy, if I could have gotten support at early age to sort of heal that, I don't think I would have gone to a lot of the physical ailments I've gone to. Um, so again, it's, it's very hopeful, but we need to take action. What are the symptoms of trauma? And you probably know these maybe intuitively. Hyper or hypo, high arousal or you're very depressed. Anxiety, hypervigilance to danger, which as a child, I was always worried. It helped me play sports because I was very on my toes, but too much. Aggression, some kids turn it into aggression. The trauma, attention lapses, lapses. I know I spaced out in school. That's why I learned so slowly. Threatened by unexpected information. Traumatic kids do not like unexpected information. Constantly interpreting parents' mood. If you have a home where your parents are inconsistent or can be harsh on you, you're always worried about them because you wanna know what's coming at you. Deficit in expressive and receptive language. I, as a child, had a tough time talking and I'm sure that was partly the trauma. You know, this can be a, a situation in any home, you know, uh, it's definitely a home of stress. Um, and if you haven't, if you have your own ACEs as a child, adverse childhood experiences, you know, parents might be fighting and the child freezes, just doesn't know what to do. But these are the things that set up um, trauma to a child that they start learning how to cope in unhealthy ways if there's not parents there to help them cope. So what happens if you have too much or too little sensations and emotions and no connection? You space out or leave the body. We said these last week. You shut down or withdraw. You get busy or speed up. I see that a lot with the people who have trauma, including myself. Sometimes you, you speed up too much. Self-medicate, soft addictions. You know, You might use alcohol or something. Be intellectual, you overthink and you don't feel, you kind of go to your left side of your brain and you're very controlling. Again, this window of tolerance is just knowing that we're trying to find that way of being in the middle and it's a learned skill, especially if you didn't get it as a child, but your child, if you're a parent can learn it. 
even in situations like this, parents could later apologize and say, you know what, I'm sorry, you know, I lost my temper. And they could be help the child repair that situation and even learn that that maybe it's not a good way to express anger. If it continues though, with no repair and no apology, then that's where the trauma is gonna set up. Again, that child under these circumstances is down here, right? So what are the symptoms of PTSD? Because they're a little different than just trauma. So like a Vietnam veteran or a war veteran from Iraq, re-experiencing the event, the flashbacks, bad dreams, fearful thoughts, avoiding places that remind you of the person of the event or the event, it should say the person or the event, hyperarousal, easily startled, reactive, easily angered, interference with cognitive functions, your attention and memory go, and mood issues, constant negative thoughts about oneself and the world, and disassociation, that means you space out. There's different PTSA symptoms for different ages. For very young children under six, signs of developmental regression like bedwetting or having toileting accidents. You lose the ability to speak or be willing, be unwilling to speak. You be overly clingy with caregivers or other adults and they may act out traumatic event during play. Often that happens, we'll talk about that. Older children, signs of developmental regression. They space out, dissociate. They're vague and dreamlike memories. Their emotional development is far behind their intellectual development. They're, they seem emotionally very young. What are these triggers of trauma that you might see in the home or the classroom? Like things you can do that can set off your child. Coercive practice where you're forcing them to do things. Because again, under trauma, usually kids have gone through something they didn't want to go through. They were forced into it, in other words. Agitated being confined. Like I don't like confining places. Chaos can trigger them. Loudly disruptive behavior can trigger them. Punishment that's sort of severe, not consequences, which are good in life. Punishment especially punitive, you know, physical punishment can be, if a child's already traumatized, could really set them off. Shame or guilt, you know, there's the trauma kids usually have a ton of that anyways. Overstimulating environment and inconsistency as a parent, that's hard in a child. Too loose, too easy, too hard, back and forth, extreme quiet and stillness. So I'm gonna skip ahead because I wanna stay get into things you can do. That's the most important to me um, tonight. So what can you do? Well, first of all, any type of connection, I'll be showing you how to do that. You're gonna, every connection be, you can be coaching your child how to self-regulate their emotions and self-soothe. Self-reflect, I'm gonna go through all these with visuals, most of them. Self-reflect out loud the three languages of the brain and I'll show you how to do all these. Practice calming and movement activity or movement strategies. Non-directed play therapy, I'll show you how to do that. Maybe see a trauma therapist you might need, you know, who's trained in trauma. EMDR is a form of trauma treatment. If you're seeking a therapist, they might do something called EMDR. It's highly effective. I, I'm trained in that. Brain spotting is another technique they can use to help you. Yoga can be really good. Neurofeedback can be very healing for trauma. These are all you, the six, seven, and nine, you, you would hire someone. And yoga, obviously, you could learn on your own. Martial arts can again be very healthy, especially if the teacher has the right orientation to helping you feel your power again and get in your body as a child. Safe places and safe experiences that you tap them in, and I'll show you how to do it. You reflect on experiences of strength and power with your child, the eye of the tiger, you know, when they felt strong and powerful and you tap them in. Touch, connection, and hugs are so soothing and healing for some, for most kids, some maybe not. Trauma release therapy, it's a form of therapy where you, you shake your hands and feet and body and you get in poses that allows the body to shake like an animal. An animal in the wild doesn't get traumatized. After overstimulating a thing, they just shake and get all, the, all of it out of the nervous system. Pets or therapy dogs are wonderful. Pressure on the body. Being in water, like a pool, is wonderful. Reflecting on what you learned or gained 
from a tough experience. And getting a calming center in your home with fidget tools, and I'll show you all these right now. And then finally, the other one you could look up is the emotional freedom technique. It's a tapping technique on acupressure points. Really does calm the nervous system. You can get a bunch of videos on the EFT tapping online. A lot of the things I'm gonna tell you right now is about right, left, right, left hemisphere, the right side of your brain, the left side. So walking and talking is really great. Being out in nature is great for the nervous system and calming. Believe it or not, juggling is another tool. Bilateral tapping, I'll show you how to do that. Brain gym exercises, you can look that up online. And of course, getting some good sleep. Other information I want you to know is trauma can be passed along your genes. So if your parents lived through the Holocaust, they're now finding that that genetic um, predisposition predisposition to trauma can be there. It takes off, it takes something in this lifetime to stimulate it, a trauma to kick it into gear, to call it to, um, to have that gene express itself. But just so you know that traumas from centuries ago can be passed along to you through genetics. We're wanting kids to get into growth. If you're in trauma, you're protecting yourself, you're not growing. What's key is who is with us before, during, and after a traumatic event. If you have a lot of support, it might not be a traumatic event to you. And you want to titrate in sensation slowly. Go very slowly when your child, if they're re, you know, if you're playing with them and they're re-experiencing something. Here's the big thing to know: children will set you up to feel what they feel. It's an energy thing. If you're tuning into your body like being a lightning rod, you're gonna pick up what they're feeling probably, or you'll gain the ability. If you look at this young girl and try to sense, look at, notice what she's doing. Like, oh, I noticed your hands are up against your face and your, your eyes are looking away. And I, I'm noticing, and for me, if I look at her, I notice my body, I feel a little scared inside. So you wanna kind of look at her and go back and notice what you're feeling in the three levels of the brain. Your brainstem is sensations. What's your body telling you right now? What emotion are you feeling, the limbic system? And what could you do to do self-care, like take a deep breath or shake your hands or rub your arms? That's the technique I'm gonna teach you. Two quick, I'll tell you one quick client story. I had a child who um, was in an orphanage who came to see me at six, I had been in a bed in China for nine months and basically didn't get touched. She got fed, but never touched, never held. And she was, she had no self-regulation. She had te temper tantrums and on and on. And the first thing she did when she came into my playroom, again, in non-directive, I don't tell them what to do. They come in and they play with the toys and they set me up to feel their world. And then I mirror that world back to them. She came and took my play handcuffs and chained me to my coat rack. So she was setting me up to feel her experience of being confined in her bed where she couldn't move. She was like in a prison. And I'll show you, what do you do? What, what did I do in that situation to help her move through the trauma? Because she was setting me up to experience her trauma, but from a distance, she continued to play with other things across the room with dolls. And I was over here, to the coat rack and I'll tell you, show you what you can do at home to work with your child if they set you up to feel the world. You just wanna be an accurate mirror. You just wanna be real and authentic and not perfect. And I gotta show you. So your job whenever you're with your child or if you're gonna take some moments to play with them, especially young kids, imaginative play, you wanna be a mirror so they get to experience what's going on inside them. So many parents lose an opportunity like this to play with their kids for five or 10 minutes. Anything you're doing with a the child, there's an energy or emotion or sensation to it. And the first thing you need to do is practice on yourself, meaning you really have to get in touch with your body over time and just get attuned to your body, feeling your stomach, feeling the sensations, and then emotions. You can print what Dr. Thomas will send you with six primary emotions and print them and put them around your house and get really good at noticing how you're feeling throughout the day. Because once you're able to feel your body sensations or emotions and then learn some self-care, 
and I'm sending some calming techniques home, but things like deep breaths and rubbing your hands and shaking your hands and moving back and forth are all ways to self-regulate or self-soothe. The more you can do it for yourself, then you're ready to play with your child and be there. I mean, you can still play, but you might not be there tuned into them as much. But here's the basic gist of it. You toggle between simple observations, well, it says of the student, but of your child, and then back to yourself and notice your body sensations and emotions. What are you being set up to feel and be an accurate mirror? But you want to titrate in the sensation and emotion slowly. Just like in hospital, they put medications in you very slowly. They drip them in because they don't want to overwhelm you. Same thing with trauma. You don't want to re-traumatize a child. Here's the six emotions you can put around your house and get really good at feeling. And the more you practice, the better you'll get. And you're going to be down in these two areas of the brain when you're playing with your child. And you're going to be, you're going to go back between the right and left hemisphere. The right side is where you feel emotions. The left side is where you're analytical and speak and you'll have language. And you go back and forth. One's artistic and intuitive. The right side, no language, just feeling, sensations. The left side's language, logic. And we play between these two worlds. A lot of our world lives in the left side of the brain. And very little of our, we learn how to be in this right side. So here's a perfect example. What would you do if you're this dad? Your son's playing with the car and maybe there's, who knows, maybe there's nothing going on, but the more often kids will act out what's inside them to play. And if you tune in and be curious and just making observations like, oh, you're playing with that truck, you're moving it back and forth and then go back and see if you can notice what the three languages, what your body sensations are and emotions and then do some self-care, it might be a deep breath. So it might sound like this, what am I feeling in my body? And maybe he's racing the car back and really, I'll have kids who move the car really fast and I just start feeling kind of scared. My stomach gets really tight and I'll say, wow, you're racing that car back really fast, going back and forth and I'm, my stomach's kind of tight and I'm feeling kind of scared right now. And I'm gonna take some deep breaths and then you go back to the child and back and forth this toggling between what are you feeling? What do you see him doing? And then again, take a pause and think on first, go to yourself. What are you feeling? And then go back to him. What do you notice he doing? And the play might change, but you're mirroring to him what's going on inside him or the probability is very high because of energy that you're picking up his emotions and sensations, or at least the play that he's setting up the field, and you're marrying back his internal world and you're self-regulating and calming yourself through it. So you're almost allowing him to watch his energy. He's setting up to feel what he feels in his body and you're self-regulating. And he's doing it in a very calm way. Instead of you saying, coming in and saying, you know what, we're gonna work on that anxiety, that fear you have about spiders, or I don't know, something, and forcing him to face it he's playing in it and you're modeling it, you know, reflecting. It. And this is, this is what I do in therapy and it's powerful in the playroom. It really is called non-directive play therapy. And again, here's a, this could be you at home and just see, like for me, when I look at all these soldiers, what do you notice? What does it feel like to you instead of being analytical? What are you feeling? And just say, and if you're not sure, say, wow, they're all scattered all over. And I don't even know what I feel. I feel confused. What do you see him doing? And back and forth, this back and forth action is gonna really help you be able to bond. I wanna look at the clock and pick out certain slides I wanna be sure to share. Well, of course you wanna have a play, an area where your kids can do expressive arts. You know, what it, what's so healing is dance or painting. Creating things is so healthy way to heal. Um, this is one of my kid clients. This is his drawing. You know, I didn't say let's draw. So that's, they know that's an option. Sometimes I offer an option to kids like, hey, do you want to draw? You know, and this is what he drew. And if you, it's kind of an issue to feel into it, don't think, but you just feel he's got all this big stuff going on inside. And it's almost like a wall around it, like he's containing it, which is, this is a kid who I worked with. This is a kid who pinned me in the corner with dinosaurs he lost his dad so this is far along so in some ways he's containing all this stuff inside so it's kind of a healthy drawing of course any kind of animal you can get stuffed or real this is my dog charlie who is a therapy dog he just knew how to be with someone 
Nothing you do for your child if they've been through trauma is help them find their strength and power. We all have it inside. And we lose, lose it when we go through trauma. It's, I call it the eye of the tiger. Focusing on strength, and there's eight ways to be smart. And you can take a test online for these to figure out where your child's strength lies. And the last, these six and seven are the social emotional intelligence, the ability to get along with others and yourself and then nature. And you know, to really hone in on their strength, their giftedness. And I'm gonna skip this. I, this could be, this is all about just a few slides on strengths. I was gonna tell you a few stories, but you get the idea. That's mostly what I wanna go through some techniques really quickly to show you that how to stimulate both sides of the brain Again, you want to go back and forth between the right hemisphere and left. Walking does it, right? This bilateral stimulation of the brain, it's very important to help heal trauma. This is a device called an EMDR thing. You put those things in your hand and the therapist has that white contraption and it just sends a pulse back and forth, gentle or strong, while you're thinking of the memory or the thing that scares you you're holding these things and it's really helps back and forth between the right side of your brain and left it's very powerful and can be very healing for some here's neural feedback for kids and again this could be very healing for trauma and you can find neural feedback therapists this butterfly hug is a great way and then tapping your right shoulder your left to, to, this can be used around strength or around a safe spot if you have a safe spot in your life or you've had a safe experience, to practice with your child thinking and feeling that and sensing it and then tapping because by tapping right, left, right, left, right, left on your shoulders, you're stimulating the different hemispheres and you're focusing on that safe place, that safe experience. This is a really good soothing technique, the butterfly hug. Believe it or not, juggling is really good for developing both sides of the brain. And uh, I still think it helps with trauma even. Brain gym, you can look it up online, is connecting one side of the body with the other side and moving left elbow, right knee, back and forth. And it connects both sides of the brain. It's great for learning disabilities too. Yoga is great for people who've been through trauma. Poses where you're in your body. It's better than meditation. Meditation can be hard for people who've been through, through trauma because sitting still and going into your trauma, your thoughts will go to your trauma. Nature and walking. I have a, a teenage client that this is where I meet him for therapy. It's right next to his home. We walk in nature together. Fidget tools versus toys to move energy and calm oneself. I, every classroom should have fidget toys and every home should have fidget toys. I curled my hair and I curled my socks. I curled my shirts. I moved my anxiety and focused my brain by twisting things. I wish I had had toys that I could have twisted or popped, or, you know, different things. These are all toys. These are the top eight toys online for fidget tools. Uh, but they're a tool if they calm you. They're a toy if they distract you. And every kid will find something that focuses them versus distracts them. And they're never universal for kids. You got to find a sweet place. But to find a place where you can sit with your child and calm themselves. Words and actions that connect. You know, it's tough. For you as a parent, because maybe you didn't get this coaching, so you're learning on the job, but just be authentic about that, saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to try to learn with you. I'm not very good at this. But these moments of connection, these are the ones that wire kids to get in that window of tolerance so they can cope later in life. And it's a learned experience. Kids learn these skills in relationship, in relationship. So emotion coaching, John Gottman at the University of Washington, I love that word. He said, if you're with a kid, 60% of your time should be observations or statements of understanding. And 40% should be self-reflection. What are you being set up to feel? What are your sensations? What are your emotions? Do your best to be an accurate mirror. Children and teenagers don't have a well-developed or wired frontal cortex. They need to borrow yours. 
Children and teenagers learn to feel and tolerate feeling their emotions by being with parents who are willing to feel their emotions or tell the truth about their own fears or resistance to doing it. Just say, hey, it's hard for me to feel my sadness, but I'll try, or I'm not good at it, but I'll try, and I'm here with you. What kids care about is I'm here with you. For a kid who's been through trauma, I'm here with you. And if they're gonna play and they feel your presence with them, and they titrate in a little, they're playing a game where they're feeling a little of that old sensation that overwhelmed them and you help them self-regulate, that's how you slowly heal trauma. What can you say to them? You seem sad. I'm curious how you're feeling. I'm wondering if you are feeling blank, sad or angry, and if you're scared about something. Your eyes look blank. This is tough or this is hard. I'm noticing that my stomach's tight and I'm feeling angry or scared or sad or hurt. And I'm going to take some deep breaths and then pause, always pause. And I'm wondering what you're feeling. You might even say this, I feel numb. I'm not sure what I'm feeling. That's a legitimate to be confused. Kids will set you up to feel confused because they're confused. And to name it helps them out loud and to be in connection with you. They're not alone in their numbness or spaced outness. They're connected to you. And that is developing the brain. I'm not very good at feeling my emotions. I'm gonna keep trying to get better. Maybe you can help me. It's tough to feel my sadness, but I'm gonna do my best. I so wanna feel what you feel, but right now I'm not feeling anything. That's a real genuine, authentic thing to, kid, thing to say, and kids respect that. And I'm here with you is what they care about most. I sense that this is really hard for you and I wanna stay here with you. Is that okay? And some kids might say no, and you respect that. You really are feeling strong emotions. And notice that my chest feels pressure on it and I'm not breathing right now, I'm gonna take a breath. I just spaced out. It must be tough for me to feel my emotions. These are all things you can say to a child when you're with them. I'm in my, I'm in, I'm in my head right now. I don't even know if I have a body. That's kind of like disassociation. Presence of feeling is more important than words. Just some simple words is enough. Here's what Harvell Hendricks said, wonderful connection words. You can marry to your child. You know, Just say, I see you, I hear you, I notice this. You feel this, you want this, you're like a mirror. You can also validate. I understand you're really angry right now. It makes sense to me you'd be really hurt that your friend didn't show up. You're making sense to me or empathizing. I'm feeling that with you. I imagine you're feeling this. These are all ways that you can really connect with the child. Remember, whenever you're with a child, you teach so much by sort of taking moments to self-reflect on the three languages, even posing for a picture like Jeffrey Canada here. Even when you're reading a book, the pause and notice. Again, you're working on trauma, believe it or not, when you're integrating the three language, using the three languages of the brain, which are the three levels of the brain, you're integrating the brain and you're titrating out trauma in gentle ways. You can do it even through, through a book. What does it sound like during the day when you're driving a car? Maybe we only have 10 minutes for school sites. I notice my heart's racing and I'm feeling scared. And I'm gonna take some deep breaths. And if your kids ask you why you're doing that, you can say, hey, I'm practicing on trying to deal with my emotions better and learn how to calm myself. And, and this is a technique and, and uh, you, know, you don't wanna do it all the time, just once in a while. I don't know if we have time. Um, let's see, I wanna do this. I'm not gonna do, um, I wanna go over the six ways and just kind of do one. These are the six ways and Dr. Thomas will send us belly breathing, heart meditation, mindfulness, body sensations, body pressure, and progressive body relaxation. Let's do the heart meditation together tonight. This is a powerful one. You place one hand on your heart and the other one on your belly. So you can't fully see me, but there is a science behind this, believe it or not. You focus your attention on your heart. And then we're gonna think of a person, place or pet that you love. And then you're gonna breathe deeply and focus on that person place and pet. So we'll go over these again. I'm going to do it just for 20 seconds and put on some quiet music. So first of all, one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly. Focus your attention on your heart right here. 
And then think of a person, a place, or an animal, pet that you love. And then breathe deeply and focus on that person, place, and pet, okay? I'm gonna put on some quiet music and we'll come back in about 20 seconds or so. Let's see if my music's coming. There we go. So that was short, but one thing about breath is if you're working with a child or yourself, if you breathe in through your nose for three to four to five seconds, and then you breathe out through your mouth twice as long, so three seconds in and six seconds out, that's going to really calm your nervous system. The other thing is pressure on the body. You can literally have your child lay on their side and just go up and down the side of the body, putting pressure on it with your hands. Very therapeutic. This dog, these thunder shorts work wonders with anxious dogs because they use the pressure technique. And then I discovered, well, I've, many people know about weighted blankets, but they, for anxious kids or kids who've been through trauma can calm their, or highly sensitive kids can calm their nervous system. The weighted blankets to put pressure on them while they sleep. This invention just came out on Shark Tank. I saw it and it's just gone off the charts. A woman who's really anxious and it was a therapist designed to sit, you get into it, and I bought one myself, it actually works. You get into it and it puts pressure on all sides of your body. You can use it during the day, which I do sometimes to take a 10 minute break to slow my nervous system, or at night, some people do it. And again, puts gentle pressure on the body, almost like someone's holding you. It's called hug sleep. And finally, I wanna tell you about Rajma Menachem, grandmother's hand. I heard him on public radio a month ago and it so uplifted me because he's from Minneapolis. He's a psychotherapist. He was talking about, um, you know, just all the issues of race. And what he focuses on is neuroscience, brain science and the nervous system and trauma. And he feels it's critically important that we all heal trauma before addressing racial issues. Whatever culture, most cultures came over here to get away from trauma, came through trauma. And if you were African-American, you, you were brought against your will through trauma here and then endured 400 years. But most cultures have some level of trauma that they haven't dealt with because there wasn't the resources. There are more available these days, not as much as we need, but the importance, because I've noticed when I did my work in therapy that I was able to heal my trauma and I deal so much else better with issues of anger in our society or conflict, whether it's about race or other issues. Because first, if I go inward and deal with my own issues, it helps me understand and have empathy and relate to other people. And we, we have, we're clearer when we do that. When we carry trauma into our relationships, it fogs them up. And it's a wonderful listen on NPR if you want to find him. He also has a book called Grandmother's Hands, looking at race and, and uh, very much from the Black American's experience, but from all people's experience too, this issue of trauma. And that's what, you know, is important to me is the brain. Some parent resources, Dr. Thomas will set, put these online for you. Trauma Proofing Your Kids, as I said, Peter Levine, I really recommend that. Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control by Heather Forbes, another good resource. My curriculum in Focus Curriculum is for schools and homes to use together. You can pull them apart for parents to use it by themselves, wouldn't be as strong. And then there's other ones that are on there that are just good for SEL. Um, so if you want to contact me and have questions or I can be of support, you can reach me at Tom at teachingheartinstitute.com. My website's just bare bones right now. In the middle of June, it'll be a brand new one. It'll be up and running. But 
It's I have just about a minute, but I'm, I'm going to take off screen share and just come back. And if anyone wants to type in a question, um, Dr. Thomas has posted those things online that you can download the common techniques, the six emotions, the parent book resources, and the adverse child experiences if you want to take the quiz and read an article on NPR, National Public Radio. Happy to take a question in text or if you know, I'll see if I can unmute. If you want to raise your hand, I'd be happy to unmute anybody. Um, and uh, you could speak it yourself, or if you want to type a question, and I'd be happy to answer a question right now for anyone. Looking for any hands. Um, I don't see any up, but I'll say this in ending. I'm so glad there's a few people showed up, but you never, I know in life, you, you know, sometimes one person, it can make a difference in their life to learn something. I know in my life, one person has different people have made a huge difference. So hopefully you learned something tonight that at least got you interested in trauma and knowing the one thing I want you to know, there's so much hope for healing. If you're in trauma right now, there is so much support to help you heal and even get stronger, come out of it stronger than you were. So I know the darkness of trauma, but um, uh, please seek out help if you need it and look for a good therapist that you connect with and someone who has a trauma background. And there are people who support people online. So um, don't give up if there's no one in your area in South Carolina. And I just, I wish you the best because I've learned personally how much a difference addressing my own trauma issues had made, has made. And I so want kids to get the support they need so they don't suffer unnecessarily because it does impact mental health, but physical health too. And there's so much unnecessary suffering in our society. And we have, we have the knowledge these days. So I hope it will get out there. And I hope parents watch this if they're not on the call tonight. Dr. Thomas, any, anything you wanna add or I'll stop right there. Okay, well, thank you again, Mr. McSheehy. Um, there's always very valuable and meaningful information. So I definitely appreciate you um, being with us again this evening to share um, the information. I have posted the resources in the comments or in the chat box, um, and we will also have those available on the website and can send those out to you. Um, so thank you to all of the educators and, and parents who may have joined. Please get the word out. Maybe we will um, have more for our, our next um, Parent Academy. But thanks again, Mr. McSheehy. I really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the partnership with focusing on uh, mental health and social emotional learning. Thanks, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thanks, parents, for showing up. Be well and have a good evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.